What up, Misfit Gang? Here we go again. Going through the Book of Romans, man. And uh, I get to show you some diamonds tonight. So I'm super pumped. Because I've been laying down a pretty thick black veil uh, for the past seven chapters. And so now we're going to get into chapter 8. But we're only going to go through verse 17. Uh, we're going to stop in verse 17. So uh, a lot of meat in a few verses. So I'm going to read through it. And then we'll pray and we'll jump into it. Therefore, there is no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. What the law could not do since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending us his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering in order that the law's requirements would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on the things of the Spirit. Now the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the Spirit is life and peace. The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it is unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who is raised, Jesus, from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. So then, brothers and sisters, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh, because if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. <laughs> but if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live for all those who uh, all those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. For if you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, instead you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children, and if children, also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Mm. Father God, thank you for this opportunity to go over your word, Lord, and, and discuss it with everybody whose ears that this lesson may reach. And Jesus, I'm a broken man. I, I have so many flaws, Lord, and I seek to please you with my mind. And sometimes I fail with my flesh, Lord. And as we go through this book, God, I just pray, God, that I would decrease and the Holy Spirit, you would take over and you would increase. You are the teacher, as we learned when we went through 1 John, Lord. You are the teacher. So I pray, God, that your spirit would teach as I am faithful to open my mouth, Lord, and share your word. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that if there are any hard hearts, any people who feel defeated by their, by their sin, people who are still caught up in shame, caught up in pride, refusing to let that little man die and hand over their weaknesses to you, Jesus. I pray they're encouraged by your words today, Lord. I, I ask in Jesus' name that you would soften their hearts and that they would be open to coming closer to you and getting to know you better. Continue to soften my heart, Lord. And draw me nearer to you every day as I marry my mind and my spirit instead of my mind and my flesh. Just to be known as your son. It's the most satisfying thing you've ever whispered in my ear, Lord, is that I'm your son. I love you, Lord. And I pray, God, that you would guide us through this lesson. In Jesus' name, amen. Got caught up praying. I almost forgot you guys were in here for a minute. Um, So... If you guys remember last week when we were going through chapter 7, 
We were talking about how there we're triune beings, just like God is a triune God. And that's what makes us in the image of God. That is the very thing that makes us in the image of God, is the fact that we are triune. We're the only thing on the entire face of the earth that is triune, that has a, a soul or a mind, a body, and a spirit. We're the only thing. So in our triunity at the fall, we learned that there was a, a flip-flop. See, originally there was a marriage between the mind and the spirit, and they were unified. And the thing that the mind was most focused on is the spirit, and the flesh was in third place. But then once the fall came and the law of God was released, as well as sin being released on the earth, then there was a flip-flop. Now all of a sudden the flesh is priority, then the mind, then the spirit. So sometimes us as believers, us as Christians, as we are coming to Jesus, and, and we see the law of God, which shines a spotlight on our sin, which causes us to recognize that we have sin, it makes us feel ashamed because we recognize that the law is good. The law is good and holy. We know that to live by the law is good and holy. And we talked about how even atheists acknowledge this. But sometimes you can feel so defeated because your flesh is unable to fulfill the law. You're literally not able to do it in your flesh. Why is that? And we go back to verse 14 in chapter 7 where it talks about the law is spirit. The law is spiritual. It's from God. So how can you obey something that's spiritual with your flesh? You can't. You have to obey it through your spirit, through your mind and through your spirit because your flesh will fail because it's bound to the law of sin, which we close with that concept in verse 25. Now we're on to chapter 8. So, so, so since we have this marriage between our mind and our flesh and our spirit comes in third place, and since our flesh is afflicted by this law of sin and, and constantly drawing us towards death, but our minds recognize the goodness of the law of God, we recognize that it's spiritual and it's holy, because of all that, there's a temptation to feel condemnation. Don't worry, though. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. Why? Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. We've been delivered from the bondage of our flesh. We've been delivered from the failure of our flesh. Now, I know that's one of those things that, without being very specific, you can just pass over. You could, you could just see that, and you could just pass right over it, and it's not a big deal. Okay, I get it, Kirk. Why are you slowing down? Why are you saying that? Why are you trying to make me say la on this concept that we've been uh, delivered from the law of sin over our flesh? Why is that such a big deal? Um, because we tend to identify with our flesh more than we do our mind and more than we do our spirit. Our mind identifies with our flesh. Ergo, when you sin, you identify as your sin. You identify as your flesh. If you're a young man or a young woman and you've stumbled in sexual sin, guess what? You now feel shame for that sexual sin and then you identify with it. But what does that do? That identifying with it, that identifying with that little man with the big shield, it causes pride to well up. Pride hardens our heart and draws us farther away from God. Rather than identifying with your flesh, if you choose, let's say you fall short. Let's say you fall short in sexual sin. Rather than identifying with your flesh, identify with your spirit and allow that flesh to die. Allow it to die. Do you, do you guys see what I'm trying to put together in your mind here? If you identify with your sin, if you identify with the fact that you're under the law of sin and refuse to recognize the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, you're doomed to continue to repeat it. You're doomed to continue to repeat the sin. See, here's my biggest beef with what a lot of people teach is your deliverance and your obedience is not, is not within the power of your flesh to complete. Because in your mind, you worship God. In your mind, you understand that the law is good, but in your flesh, you have an inability to carry it out. 
So if you keep looking to your flesh to carry out your obedience to God, you will fail seven times out of seven. Well, Kirk, the message you're selling me is, is pretty hopeless. No, 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 don't misunderstand me. The way to obedience is not through the marriage of your mind and your flesh, it's through the marriage of your mind and your spirit. The spirit of God that was placed in you and your spirit, your inner self, that inner person, the marriage of that inner self, that inner person, and the marriage of your mind, delighting in God's law, is what will deliver you into obedience, not obsession over your flesh. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. What the law could not do since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. You guys understand when we were t- talking in the last chapter, we talked about how the law was weakened by the flesh because when sin entered the earth, right, the law sp- shined a spotlight on sin, which makes it run more rampant. It's the same thing as when you, when you, if any of y'all ever grew up in the ghetto or grew up in a rough neighborhood like I did, when you come home, you flip the lights on, roaches run, right? You cause it to spread because the flesh, if it's the primary, if it's the primary, the flesh delights in sin. So when the law shines a spotlight on it, the flesh draws more into it. Do you see what I'm saying? That doesn't mean that the law isn't holy. That just simply means that as the law, the holiness of the law, shined on the sin of the world, it caused it to run more rampant because our flesh is unable to overcome and follow the law, even if our minds worship it. That's what Paul's trying to reiterate here. What the law could not do since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. Praise Jesus. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering in order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. This is a hard concept for some people to get a hold of, and I don't know why. In the pursuit of dying to your flesh, you're identifying with Jesus. But it's not through the power of your flesh that you die to your flesh, but it's through the power of your mind and your spirit. See, there's this concept in John, it's called logos. And logos in Greek basically means the creative process, the inner creative process. See, some people translate it as word. That's a horrible, horrible translation. It's way deeper than that. It's the inner working. It's in here. It's in the mind. It's when, say I wanted to create a, a birdhouse, whatever. Say I wanted to create a table. Before, that, before I ever started working my hands, drawing up the schematics, before I ever pulled out the first tool, that table was created in here. That was the logos, the creative process. Okay, So with that creative process tied into my spirit, as I set my mind and my spirit on the things of the Lord, it doesn't matter if my flesh fails sometimes, because it will. It will. And the reason that doesn't matter is because Jesus paid that cost for the failure of my flesh. Thank you, Jesus. For those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on the things of the Spirit. Now, I can attest to this. I talk to a lot of people. I'm a social butterfly, man. I hang out and I talk with a lot of people from a lot of different facets and a lot of different walks in life. And one of the things that I noticed is a lot of Christians go through this process where they start to feel defeated in their faith. And this this is such a huge point. They feel defeated in their faith because they set their minds on the things of the flesh. And when we think of the things of the flesh, we think of what, guys? Drugs, sex, right? These are the things we think of as the things of the flesh. How about gluttony? That's a thing of the flesh. Constantly overeating, 
being consumed with pleasing yourself? How many stress eaters do we have watching this video today? Probably quite a few of you. How about this? The praise of men. That's a thing of the flesh. You could be doing a righteous deed. Righteous deed. You could be out serving orphans. You could be out helping widows. But why? Why are you doing it? Is it for the praise of men or for the praise of God? It's a righteous deed. But are you pursuing your flesh or are you pursuing the Spirit of God? You know, I see this a lot in ministry, if I'm honest. I see uh, all the years I've been in ministry, I have see a lot of people who do things, and when they do things, they do things in a heart of self-praise or self-promotion. And I see this a lot, and I'm just being blunt honest with you guys, and, and I know you guys have experienced this as well. Brothers and sisters in Christ, and I call them that, brothers and sisters in Christ who get obsessed with titles. They get obsessed with titles. They want to be called deacon. They want to be called pastor. They want to be called reverend. They want to be called bishop. They want to be called all these titles. Hi, my name's Kirk. Kirk Martin. I am a pastor. That's true. But let's say your gift is service. Let's say you're really good at serving people. Do I call you Service Jane or Service John? Well, then why are you calling me Pastor Kirk? My name's Kirk. My name's Kirk. And I'm a man. I'm a child of God, just like you. I just have a different calling. And my calling is to share the truth of God's word. The truth of God's word. So I don't want you guys to conflate because I feel like this is something that us as Christians struggle with a lot. We conflate things as nothing in and of itself. I mean, obviously, if you're smoking crack cocaine, crack cocaine, there's no way that that's righteous ever, okay? But that's blatantly unrighteous. But substances in and of themselves or acts in and of themselves are not necessarily righteous. It's what is your pursuit as you're doing those acts. Do you understand? You picking up what I'm putting down? You smelling what I'm stepping in? If you can do a good deed, you can do good things, but if your motive or your, your primary pursuit in doing that good thing is praise from other people, well, that's a fleshly act. I don't know why I jumped on that. It must have been the Spirit. But those who live according to the Spirit have their mindset on the things of the Spirit. Now, these are the people in ministry, which I also have had thousands and thousands of encounters with these type of people. These are the people in ministry who don't give a rip whether you respect them or not. They don't care if you ever pay them or not. That's a big one. They don't care if they ever receive payment for a thing that they do. They do it because it's what the Spirit of God is calling them to do. And they walk in that. You feel me? They walk in that, regardless of what the consequences of their actions are. They walk in that. They don't care if they're praised by men. They don't care. They do it because they know that the Spirit of God has called them to do it, and they set their mind on the Spirit of God. And I'm not just talking about people that you see in ministry. I'm talking about the mechanic down the street who serves people with the heart of God serve people. I'm talking about the, 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 the plumber that plums your house, the, the concrete guy that pours your slab, but he pours your slab with the sole purpose of being an effective witness for Jesus Christ. I'm talking about that guy, a spirit-minded person focused on the things of the spirit, somebody that will stop what they're doing in the middle of their busy day while they're busy earning a living for their families and pray with you. Somebody who's got their, their spiritual perspective in order. That kind of person. Now the mindset of the flesh is death. But the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. I love that. I love that. You can always see, you know, let's be honest. We all have personalities. I have a personality. 
All of you watching this have a personality. Sometimes when two people who either, usually it's two people who have similar personalities, meet, or sometimes it's people with polar opposite personalities, like an extrovert and an introvert, sometimes we meet people and we just don't get along. Something about our personalities jive. I got somebody who I consider a friend. I love this brother dear, dearly, but for some reason, every time we go to hang out, like there's this weird unspoken tension. It's just strange. It's like every time we are around each other, and I know what it is. We both have strong personalities. We're both very, you know, strong people. You know what I mean? As far as like uh, accomplishing tasks and things of that nature. Um, I don't hold that against him. I live in peace with him. I love him. I pray for him. I pray for him. I pray for his family. I pray for him all the time. I don't hold that against him. I am him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sometimes you're going to meet people that you're person. But you can always, my point is you can always tell a spirit-led person, a person that seeks to live in peace and unity with everyone around them, who walks humbly and pursues peace. Pursues peace. Jesus would say, the keepers of peace shall be known as the sons of God. And I tell you this, there is nothing more precious than to be known as a child of God. To me. And I know that's probably just due to my past and my predispositions on parents and stuff and the way that God ministers to my heart by acknowledging that he's my father. That ministers to me a lot. There's nothing I love more than to be known as a child of God. I love that. So because of that, regardless of how much my temper flares and I want to be one of the sons of thunder and I want to prove I'm right, so what does that matter at the end of the day? What does that matter at the end of the day? If I have disunity with my brother or my sister in Christ, the spirit is life and peace. I have that highlighted, just that part of that verse in my Bible. The spirit is life and peace. I love that. The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it is unable to do so. <laughs> Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Oof. Ow. Ow. Paul, you gotta say it like that. You gotta say it like that, man. But you don't understand. I joined the Peace Corps, man. You don't understand. I went overseas and I put wells in Africa and I fed thousands in a village. You don't understand. I donate blood every single week. I donate plasma all the time. You don't understand. Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. You're pursuing a self-righteous justification. That in the end, all you're doing is pleasing your own flesh. Because you're trying to prove to your inner self that you're worthy. You have a psychological predisposition that makes you feel like more fulfilled if you have other people's needs being met. That doesn't mean you're holy. You can fill other people's needs all day long. That doesn't make you holy. Only God can do that. I know. I know. It's crazy. I didn't write the stuff, okay? I'm just telling you what the book says. I'm telling you what the Spirit speaks is truth. Unless you're doing something for an external reason, not an internal reason, guys. The external reason is you're seeking to please the one who created everything. Unless you're doing it in pursuit of God, you're wasting your time. So I encourage you, Misfit, right now, if you are involved in something, I want you to pray about whether or not what you're involved in whether it's sports, whether it's you know a relationship, whether it's whatever it is, whether it's a job, and ask yourself, what are my motivations in what I'm doing, even if they appear good? And I'm not telling you to bail out from those things. I'm not telling you to quit those things. I'm telling you to ask God to change your, change your heart in whatever that thing is. And you know maybe he calls you out of it. I don't know. I'm not God. I don't know. Maybe he calls you out of it. Maybe you're in a job. But your heart in that job is to get close to somebody who, you know, creates a negative soul tie and is destructive to your relationship. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe your heart in that job is solely focused on money and finances when really it should be serving God in your day-to-day -day life. 
I don't know. Only you know that. Only you and the Lord. Pray about it, though. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. <sighs> Sounds terrible. If Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. Whose righteousness? Because of your righteousness? Because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He gives your spirit flesh. See, we get the process all backwards. You know what I'm saying? I hear this all the time. Well, listen, man, listen, man. The second I stop smoking weed, I'll come visit you at church. You got the process backwards, man. I'll tell you what, man. The minute me and my girl stop sleeping together, I'll come visit you at church, Kurt. You got the process backwards, man. No, you come to church and allow God to marry your mind and your spirit, and the flesh will follow because the flesh is only renewed with the power of the spirit. That's why you're defeated. Oh, I love this chapter. That's why you're defeated. That's why you're defeated in your sin. Because your constant pursuit and obsession on that sin is focused on your flesh. I mean, let's say, I don't know, let's say you're, 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 sex, you're a sexual addict. You look at pornography, right? And if all day long you're thinking, can't look at pornography, I just can't. I can't look at pornography. You know what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to look at pornography. Guess what words you just said in your head 497 times? Pornography. Guess what you're going to end up doing? Looking at pornography. You're, you're, you're focusing your strength on your willpower and flesh, and that's what got you in trouble in the first place. Do you understand what I'm saying? The power to overcome and obey the Spirit is, uh, and obey the law of God is through the Spirit, not through the flesh. So first you have to allow your mind to be renewed through the Spirit of God, and it's not genie in the bottle. This isn't like a snap overnight thing. It's a marriage. It's a courtship. It's a courtship. You draw close, closer in that relationship. The older I get, the more me and the Lord become intimate and closer with one another. And as the, clo the more I set my mind on him, the more intimate we become, the more the things in my flesh just begin to fall away. I don't even pay attention to him anymore. It's like, I mean, he convicts me, don't get me wrong. If, I, if I'm doing something wrong, the Holy Spirit will convict me, but it's not, the conviction isn't, oh! <gasps> The conviction is, oh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yes, Lord, got you. And I don't obsess over it. Yes, got you, Lord. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I need to get refocused on you. That's my problem. I need to get refocused on my relationship with you. Stop trying to do things in your flesh. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. Just kind of reiterates that last rant I went on. So then, brothers and sisters, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh. But if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. <laughs> I love how matter of fact Paul is in this letter. If you live according to the flesh, you're going to die, period. But if... By the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Don't say that too fast. You might miss the point. But if by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So Jane and John, if you muster up your own strength to just be a better person and you just fight really, really hard. No, not what it says. Not what it says. Not what God's word says. Sorry. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all those led by God's spirit are God's sons. Thank you, Jesus. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Let me read that one more time. 
For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received a spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. This is an important, this is very important understanding. We've talked about this all throughout the course of the, the past few times we, we've been going through 1 Peter, 2 Peter, and, and even we mentioned it again in Romans. We have this concept that when we fall short of the glory of God, and we do, and you do, every day, I promise, I know I did several times today. As we fall short of the glory of God, our gut reaction, because we had fleshly, earthly fathers, is that God is mad at us, and God doesn't want to speak to us. But if we really thought and considered it, I'm a dad, and I know my baby girl is not perfect, but what would you rather have? Would, I mean, what would I rather have? Do I want to be angry with my daughter and punish her? Or do I want to restore her? Do I want to bring her back in close? Do I want to hold her? Do I want to encourage her to pursue back towards righteousness if she's made a mistake, if she stumbled in her walk with the Lord? I assure you, it's the latter. I want to restore my baby girl. I don't want to condemn her. I don't want to put her down. I don't want to make her feel less than because she stumbled in sin. I want to restore her. I don't care what the sin is. Do you understand me? That's my daughter. That's my child. I love her. And even though I may be mad for a moment because I'm flesh, I'll get over it real quick. I'm like a firecracker. I boom, and then I'm gone. I'm back to chill. I want to restore my daughter. God wants to restore us. Only he's not flesh. He's spirit. So he goes straight to restoration. God goes straight to restoration. That fear... That fear that is a, an outpouring of the sin in the world, that's really what it is. It, that fear is the, the, when you feel fear, when you fall short of the glory of God and you feel that fear come over you, that's the pressure of sin in this world driving you towards that little man called shame. That's what that is. Because the reality is, if you, were just, if you would just confess those things to the Father, and ask him to heal you in your spirit and walk towards him and focus on him. I'm not saying you're not going to ever stumble again, but you'll stumble a lot less. Especially if you refuse to identify with what it is that you stumbled in. If you will stop acknowledging that little jerk with a big shield of pride, if you will stop acknowledging him, if you will stop running towards him and, and condemning yourself every time you fall short, stop all that and just focus on God. Focus on running after him. I'm not saying don't look at your sin. I'm not saying don't acknowledge your sin. I'm simply saying don't identify with it because you have a loving father who wants to draw you into his righteousness, but we allow fear and bondage to snatch away the beauty and the peace of being known as a child of God and resting in his arms and in his love. I love that. The spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if God's children also heirs, this is humbling. And I, I still struggle to receive this next part of this statement. And, child, and if children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Sometimes, when you're killing something, it hurts. That's true. So when I say focus on Jesus and allow your flesh to die, that's not me saying that it's going to feel good. Right? I mean, if you're an alcoholic and you stop drinking, guess what? You're going to go through DTs. If you're addicted to pain pills and you stop using pain pills, you're going to go through withdrawals. Trust me, I know. They hurt. They're terrible. They're very painful. But it was spirit-led, and there was a peace in it because I knew that what I was walking towards was deliverance from my flesh. When you're allowing yourself to be delivered from pornography, when you're allowing yourself to be, and this is a big one, listen to this, when you're allowing yourself to be delivered from negativity, negativity, 
I just see it on people's lives, and it makes me just nauseous and compassionate at the same time. You ever felt like that? That's a Holy Spirit thing. You could just be nauseous towards something and just compassionate at the same time. Like, God, I wish you quit doing it. It's like watching somebody just shoot themselves in the foot. It's like, I love you so much. That is a horrible idea. Just surrounded, shrouded in negativity. Because there's actually, it's scientifically proven, there's, you can cause your brain to, to release adrenaline and endorphins just by allowing yourself to feel sad. And so you see people that gravitate towards this. They use their own chemical reactions in their brain as a drug. And they get addicted to neg negativity. So guess what? When you stop giving yourself that drug, it's not going to feel good at first. And you're going to be in this weird limbo where you're feeling bipolar. You don't know if you're happy or sad because you're, you don't, you're trying to learn how to balance and understand your emotions rather than just rest in this one end of your emotions, you know? It's almost like you've been holding up a, like 10,000 bricks for a really long time, and now you've got to slowly start to let those bricks drip out, you know what I mean? Through the power of the Spirit. As you're delivered from those things, it's not always going to feel good. That's my point. And in that, we share in the sufferings of Christ. But because we share in the sufferings of Christ as we pursue the Spirit and allow our flesh to die, literally get murdered, as we allow our flesh to die and we marry our minds to our spirits and we grow more into the image of God, even though we suffer, we're glorified with Him. That's hard for me to receive. Co-heirs with Jesus. Do you know who Jesus is? He's God. He's God, created the universe. And the Bible tells us that we are co-heirs. I can't wrap my mind around it. And I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that I can. I can't. I cannot wrap my mind around the vastness of that statement. I can't. It's too lofty for me. I'm only a man. I mean, if you were to take that, just that one sentence in God's word and try to expand it all the way to the end, just take that one thought and carry it to the nth degree, I can't go there. I don't understand it. How could I be co-heir with the God of the universe? All because I chose to trust in him and allow my flesh to die. I don't know. But guess what? I'm thankful. I'm really thankful. I'm grateful and I believe by faith that what he tells me is true. There's a lot of things I can prove with science and facts and evidence that at the end of the day, the only way to please God is faith. And I believe by faith that I get the blessed opportunity to be a co-heir with Jesus and glorified with him as I focus on the Spirit and allow my flesh to die. Stop using your flesh to overcome your flesh. If there's one thing I want you guys to take away from this message, stop using your flesh to overcome your flesh because the law is spirit. And obeying the law requires the spirit. So let's continue to fill our minds with the spirit of God and allow it to manifest in our lives and let our flesh die. I love you guys very much. Misfit gang, I will see you Friday. And if you're listening online, as usual, love, peace, and chicken grease.